Today's lecture is on databases that are larger than the amount of memory that's available to the database system. So uh, again, still in lockdown here at my house. Uh, the Terriers over there, it's sort of asking questions as we go along, um, but it hasn't been very good before. So people are complaining that like the tier doesn't ask the questions that they want to ask, but it is one of this. So before we get into uh, today's lecture material, I first want to do a quick uh, overview on what's coming up for you, for those of you that are enrolled in the course this semester, like the upcoming uh, deadlines and dates. So on Wednesday this week, I will be releasing the uh, final exam. Um, it, it was originally due a week from uh, Wednesday, so next week. I've now extended that to have the final exam being due on the, on the 13th. So everyone's gonna have three weeks now to actually complete it. Um, <coughs> What's that? Okay, the Terrier's question is, uh, can we have a, you know, can the class have a practice exam before I release this? Uh, no, because you'll see that it's sort of a long form question based on the material that we discussed this semester. And now that I'm giving you three weeks to actually do it, uh, th there's no point in releasing a, a practice exam first. The next thing is that on Wednesday, uh, next week, we will have a, uh, hopefully the guest speaker from Amazon come give a talk. For this one, because of Amazon's restrictions, we're gonna have to make this a live lecture that will only be accessible to CMU students. And so you'll need to come at the time that, it, that, that we normally would have scheduled, class scheduled. It'll be 12, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because uh, th this will not be recorded. So now, also in terms of Project 3, the second round of code reviews will be due on May 4th, and then we'll have now our final presentations at our originally scheduled uh, final exam time on May 5th at 5.30 p.m. And so again, we'll just go to the, on the Zoom channel and everyone will, will present as we've done with the, the status updates from before. And again, and then the final exam will be due on the 13th. So the... The main thing I'll say about this, uh, so for the code reviews, Matt and I will go through this week and give feedback on the first round of code reviews, and that'll prepare you for the second round. And the idea is that you want to take all the suggestions that the other team made about your project from the first round and actually apply them to the second round. I right? don't want to sort of make the same mistakes all over again and have them just sort of repeating themselves. Okay? All right. So... As I said in the very beginning of the of the semester, which seems like a long time uh, from now, um, back in January, was that this class was focused on in-memory databases, and that all of the uh, algorithms and methods and, and architectural decisions that we've talked about this entire semester have based been based on this assumption that the database resides entirely in main memory, meaning we're not writing algorithms or not writing you know joint algorithms that can maximize or minimize the amount of disk I.O. that they incur. We're just assuming that anytime we follow a pointer to a tuple or a, a, a you know, some, some buffer region, that that's going to always be in memory. Now, the downside of this is, so, I mean, the upside is that, as, as we've seen throughout the entire semester, this allows you to implement things uh, way more efficiently because you don't have to have this, all these checks or, or to account for the fact that like in a disk oriented system, anytime you go touch a you know, piece of memory, that it might actually be in memory. It's only on disk and you have to get, you know, go through the buffer manager to go and get it. So we, if we, you know, we can write our system to, without that assumption, it's gonna go really fast. The downside is however, and what the in-memory marketplace has sort of shown, uh, in-memory database marketplace has sort of shown the last uh, decade is that SSDs and spinning disk hard drives still provide, or still, in terms of price versus performance, are still a, you know, uh, they still have, provide certain uh, properties that would be desirable in, in even for modern app, uh, database applications. And this is because DRAM, at its core, is expensive, right? And it's expensive both to, to buy relative to DRAM and, or sorry, to SSDs and, and spinning disk hard drives. So roughly in 2020, 
the price of uh, per gigabyte for a spinning disk hard drive is around two to three cents. For NAND flash, it's it's less than a dollar. And you know, a few years ago, I saw it being you know thirty cents, um, you know, per gigabyte. Whereas in DRAM, um, it's gone down in recent years because of uh, some lawsuits, which we can take that offline. Um, but the it's it's roughly maybe like around five to six dollars per gigabyte, right? This is assuming that you're buying in bulk, like as a manufacturer, not like you're going to Amazon and buying, um, you know, this, this, you know, DIMMs for your machines. Like you're you're a major manufacturer that can buy this uh, in bulk. So it's expensive to buy. The other thing that we haven't really talked about too is that it's expensive to maintain. Meaning, when I put it in my computer and I'm or my server and I'm and I'm you know, plug the server in, I'm actually running it, the percentage of the electricity that's being used to power that machine, um, a sizable portion of it is going to, to DRAM. Now, this is ignoring like doing like Bitcoin mining or, or you know, uh, neural net training on GPUs. Those things are definitely bigger power hogs than, than DRAM. And so that those are draw, draw most of the power. In sort of a database server, uh, that's not doing stuff on the GPUs, it's going to be a roughly about 40%. This was a survey that was done a few years ago where they actually went and measured how much memory was being drawn by the DIMM slots, and they showed it like on, on average about, it was about 40%. So that means like all the power that you, you're paying for to run your machine, 40% of that is going to, to, to DRAM. So now that means if I'm running an in-memory database where the database has to fit entirely in DRAM, uh, the larger my database, the more DRAM I have to buy, and then more power I'm going to use to, to, to maintain it. So essentially what the motherboard is doing is like every so often, right, I think it's in every couple seconds, it's sending a charge to the DIMMs so that they can refresh the, their, what they're storing. Um, and of course this is why you, if you pull the, pull the power on them, you can't do that refresh and then and you lose your data. So given that we spent the entire semester talking about how to make a really fast in-memory database system. It'd be nice if we could bring back one of these slower uh, non-volatile storage devices, NAND flash or spinning disk hard drive, and get the benefit of being able to write out data to, to those disks without having to bring in all the architectural components that we were avoiding and algorithms that we were avoiding by going you know, from a disk oriented architecture and pulling that back into an in-memory system so that we just end up with that slower disk oriented architecture that, that we were trying to avoid in the first place. So that's what the, the focus on t today is. So we'll first talk in the background about the, the different choices or we could have um, and why we want to do this for, to, to support larger than memory databases in an in-memory database system. Then we'll talk about how you actually want to go and implement this. And then we'll finish up talking about um, some real implementations of the various techniques that we'll, we will talk about today. So at a high level, as again, I've, I've already said this, but just to repeat it, um, the goal of what we're discussing today is enabling an in-memory database management system to be able to store and access data that's been written out the disk, but without having to bring back all of the slow parts, in particular, the buffer pool manager that we got rid of when we went to an in-memory architecture, right? And so another sort of engineering uh, change we wanna try to achieve is that as we bring back the disk, we don't wanna have to go and touch all our, uh, all our components in our system to now account for the fact that data that it could be accessing is, uh, is not in, in memory and it's on disk. Like if we bring back a traditional buffer pool manager, this is somewhat the case because anytime we go access a, a you know a, a location we need to know we would have to know what page or block it, it it's in it, it resides in and go through a buffer manager to do this for us so we'd have to go modify the entire system to now instead of just go reading a piece of memory as we did before to now go through the buffer pool manager and get a page or get a block of memory uh that we can then access and know the offset within that right that's going to be slow the algorithms that are designed to, to minimize disk I.O., those are going to be much slower than the random access ones that we've been talking about today. So the, the way we're going to have to do this, or the way, you know, the, is that we need to be aware of the 
the sort of fundamental differences between you know, non-volatile storage, like a spinning disk hard drive and NAND flash, and in-memory uh, volatile storage. And the core difference is that for in-memory storage, it's going to be tuple-oriented, essentially byte addressable, that I can go access uh, to jump to some memory location, and that that's where my tuple will reside. In a, a disk-oriented architecture, in a disk storage model, it's going to be block-oriented or page-oriented, meaning I can't jump to just a single byte in memory or in a page and just get that data and bring it in, into memory. I got to go fetch the entire 4 kilobyte or 8 kilobyte page that my the data that I want resides in. Even if I don't want the other parts, I only maybe want one kilobyte of that 4 kilobyte page, I'm bringing in the entire 4 kilobyte pages, right? So this this is what we have to deal with when we design a a, a a capability that allows us to move data in and out of disk in our in-memory architecture. So the other important thing to discuss is that the for this entire lecture, we're going to focus on OLTP workloads or OLTP systems. And then we can do this in the context of an HTAP system where we're running the OLAP system, the OLAP workload and the OLTP workload at the same time. But for the OLAP, OLAP queries, there really isn't going to be anything special or magical we can do in an MMRE database system to make the disk accesses that they're going to incur go faster. Because at the end of the day, OLAP queries are going to do, for the most part, large sequential scans over, uh, or those sequential scans over large segments of the table, or, the, or maybe even the entire table. Now, maybe accessing just a subset of the columns and a column store could, could alleviate the, the, the issue of bringing in data that you don't actually need. Um, and we can do that, but that's not anything special because we're in memory. Because a disk-oriented database system can, can, can still be a column store and still get that same benefit. Right, so again, the main thing I'm trying to point out here is that there's nothing really we're going to do because we're an in-memory system to make disk I.O. Uh, for OLAP queries go better. The only thing we can, that we can really do is, like, say we have a column um, that we know in our table that we want to scan, well, we can compute a zone map for it, like a pre-computed aggregation, aggregates for, for the column, like the min, the max, you know, all the things you would run on, want to run aggregation stuff on, and keep that in memory at all times. And the, the, the rest of the column, the actual data itself, we shove out the disk. And so we can use this zone map to try to figure out what, whether or not we need, actually need to access that column on disk or not, depending on what, what query we're trying to do. Um, and that's just the data skipping technique we saw before when we talked about doing uh, compression in, in a database system. But again, an, a, a, a disk oriented system can still use zone maps and, and there's nothing special because we're in memory here. So again, for this reason, there's not much we can, we can do for make, make OLAP stuff go away. All the same optimizations that we would do in a disk oriented system in our buffer pool, like scan sharing or buffer pool bypass, we can still apply them here. So the reason why we're going to focus on an OLTP is because they are going to have this, uh, this, this very common pattern where there's going to be this notion of hot data and cold data in the database. And the idea is that we want to keep the hot data in memory because that's the data we're going to be updating or accessing over and over again more, more often. And then the cold data, we then shove out the disk. And the idea is that we still have a... Uh, we're still keeping track of that cold data in memory so that we know it exists and we don't have any false negatives. Uh, you know, we do a lookup for a tuple in its own disk and say, oh, we don't know anything about it. Like, we, we're going to avoid that, but we're just not going to pay the, the storage penalty in memory to have all that cold data around in memory, even though most of the time we're not going to need it. So I need the, the example I always like to use of understanding hot versus cold data would be something like Reddit or Hacker News. Right? Most people are going to post comments on the latest articles that have been posted on Reddit within the last you know, 24 hours or so, so many days. Right? Few people are going back and posting comments on you know, articles that were, that, were, that were uploaded or posted you know, six months ago. Right? And I, actually, I don't think even Reddit even lets you do comments on old articles. Um, so again, the idea is that the recent posts we want to keep in memory because those are the ones that everyone's reading and, and, and making updates to. The older stuff, we can shove out the disk. If anybody comes in and goes looking for it, we'll go fetch it from disk and bring it to memory and serve it to them. But most of the time, we, we don't need that. And then the likelihood that someone's going to read that same article 
uh, a cold article immediately after it was uh, brought back into memory from disk is actually very low. So we can go ahead and shove, shove it back out the disk later on, all right, and save, save space. So again, some applications, like I said, in Reddit, where they will actually uh, prevent you from posting on articles that are that are that become a certain age. That mechanism is actually something that the application does. It's not something that the database management system enforces. As far as I know, nobody, no database system actually says, "All right, this stuff is old. Uh, we won't let you modify it because it it doesn't know that you know you're not you're inserting into a table." Like the comments are getting inserted into a separate table from when the article is actually posted. So it doesn't know you can't do that. Um, at least as far as I know, no system actually does this. So again, the purpose of what we're trying to do today is, is this piece here. Like we need the mechanism to allow us to identify that we have this cold data, what it is, where it is, shove it out the disk, and then if it's ever needed again, bring it back in. Another way to conceptually think about this too is that in what we're trying to do is push cold data out of memory onto disk. Contrast this with a disk-oriented system where you pull hot data from disk and bring it into memory. So this seems like a sort of a semantic difference and hopefully as we go along this will make more sense. But like the, the system is being architected such that cold data is moved out to disk whereas in a disk-oriented system hot data is pulled in. All right, so let's look at a high level example here. So we have uh, now we have a database now that can support writing out data to cold data storage. This is some, some, some spinning disk hard drive or NAND flash or EBS, whatever you want. Doesn't matter for our purposes right, right now. And then in memory, we still have our in memory index. Uh, and then we have our in memory table heap. And for now, assume that everything's fixed, fixed size and just, you know, it all exists in, in this one space here. So the say now we have a mechanism to look at our tuples and identify which ones are cold. So we have a way to identify that these three tuples here are, haven't been accessed in, 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 in the recent, recent time, unlikely to be accessed in the future. Again, how exactly we do that, we'll cover in a second. But for whatever reason, we think these three are, are candidates to be evicted. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna pull them out of our table heap, uh, combine them into uh, a page or a block that we then write out to disk. So this would now be our evicted tuple block. There's some header that's saying, here's, what, you know, here's what's in here. And then we have our, our tuple data. And for this, assume that we're organized as a row store. A column store could essentially work the same way. Because if you do a packs organized uh, block, right, this could be laid out in, in a column store within the page. But all the, the values or all the attributes for a given tuple can be found in, in, this, in this block. All right, so now the first question we have to deal with is, what do we do with the holes that we just made in our table heap, right? We have now empty space that we could reuse. What are we actually gonna, you know, when do we actually wanna put stuff in there? Because the issue is that the index now is, because everything is now in, in, in a memory database, you know, you're having 64-bit pointers to, to other locations in memory to identify tuples. It's not a, you know, page ID and an offset as you would in a or slot number as you would in a disk oriented system. These pointers are now pointing, are still in the index, are still pointing to these empty slots. So now if I could do a lookup and try to find this tuple you know, that, that used to be here, I'm gonna land in, you know, look, you know, some empty space now, because somebody else could, could now be the, yeah, I could have put another tuple in this space. But now let's say that this query comes along and this query now wants to reference one of the tuples that we just evicted, right? So this is accessing tuple one, but now tuple one is, is somewhere out on disk. So the question is we have to deal with is, well, how, how are we actually going to find it? How are we actually going to be able to identify that, oh, tuple zero one, it's not in memory anymore, right? It's, it's out on disk. Then say we, if we can actually identify that it is on disk, we need to bring it back into memory. And now the question is, what do we actually do? Because as I said, the, 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 the cold data storage on our disk is, is block oriented. So I can't just go grab tuple zero one and just copy the, the bytes exactly for that tuple and bring it into my, my table heap. I gotta bring this whole block in. And so now I'm bringing in tuple one, but also three and four, but I didn't ask for three and four. I only wanted one. So what do I actually do? Do I merge all three tuples back in? Do I just merge one tuple in and then leave a hole out on disk? 
So these are the questions that, that, that we're trying to answer today, how we actually want to uh, orchestrate all of this. So the, the issues we're going to have to deal with are, are the following. Um, and again, we're focusing on OTP systems where we assume that actually trans you know, transactions or queries could, or could try to actually not just access, but also update or modify tuples that, that are data that's been shoved out to disk. So the first thing we had to deal with is uh, for the runtime operations is what are we actually going to do while the transaction or the data system runs queries and transactions to keep track of whether data is is hot or cold? Like how are we going to keep track of or, and and identify oh when it's time to evict or we want to evict some data, which tuples or which blocks uh, haven't been accessed in a while and therefore we want to go ahead and evict them. The next is the eviction policy. Right? This is when the, the database recognizes that it's running out of space, running out of memory. Um, so it says, let's go ahead and, and evict some data. So the first question is, when should it actually fire off the eviction? Um, the next is like what metadata we're going to keep track of to, to record that there used to be data here in memory, but it's now out on disk. And here's how to go find wh where it's located on disk. And we need to do this because we need to avoid false negatives. So we don't want to write, we don't want to be back here and write out tuple one uh, to, to disk. Then this query comes along and it says, oh, I want tuple one, but we only consult this portion here of the table heap, which doesn't have tuple one anymore. So it would come back and say, oh, I, I don't know anything about tuple zero one. Like you, what you're asking for doesn't exist. And therefore this thing would re return incorrect answer. So we need a way to identify that the in memory that there used to be a tuple zero one here. And here's, here's, the, here's the information on where to go to find it on disk. So that's the metadata we're, we're kind of keep track of here. Then now when we go and, and recognize that we actually do need data on disk, the question is how much data should we actually bring in? What do we actually do with the query or transaction that requested that data? And where do we actually put the data that, that they've requested? Right, like where in memory, the table heap or maybe a private buffer, right? We'll cover all these, di these different design decisions. And these all come from a paper that we wrote in 2016 with one of my PhD students, um, where we were looking at this idea of, again, how do you actually support large in memory databases in, in a in-memory database system? So what I'll say though, this was based on a system that I helped build in grad school called HStore, which was then commercialized in 2008, uh, 2009 as, as VoltDB. Most of the mechanisms we're talking about here are gonna be uh, sort of tuple oriented, like fine grain eviction and fine grain identification of individual tuples. But the paper I had you guys read, uh, Lean Store, which came much after uh, this particular paper here, was doing this on, on, uh, at, at the page level. So some of the things that we'll talk about here don't make sense if you're trying to do it at a page level because they have a sort of more coarse grained view of what data is hot and cold and how they actually keep track of the metadata of you know, when things get evicted. But it's important to understand you know, sort of the fine grained approach and then you'll hopefully then appreciate better why the Lean Store idea uh, actually I think is really good. All right, so again, the first thing we had to do was how to identify wh what data is cold in our database. So the first choice is to do what I'll call online identification, meaning as the database system is executing transactions or executing queries, we are keeping track of what tuples they're accessing, what data they're accessing. Um, and then we have to then maintain some uh, metadata directly in the tuples or pages themselves that we then update as our, as our queries are, are accessing them. And the reason why you want to embed it in, in the tuple itself is because you don't want to have to maybe go then consult a uh, auxiliary data structure to say, hey, by the way, I've, I've updated this tuple. All right, find me the tuple entry in my tracking data and then update it. Because then you're paying the, the you know, storage penalty of having that extra, extra data structure. And then you're also paying the computational uh, overhead of having to update it every single time you access a tuple. So for, uh, in, when we did this in HStore, the, the, we would store actually a 64-bit pointer uh, of a tuple to the, the next most recently accessed tuple. We were essentially maintaining a, 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 an LRU chain 
all in visual tuples. So 64 bits per tuple is not ideal. Um, and so the, if, the, if the tuple is very large, if it has a lot of attributes, then the overhead is kind of small. But if it only has like two attributes, like two 32-bit pointers, or sorry, 32-bit integers as, as its attributes, then an additional 64-bit pointer to keep track of the metadata is essentially doubling the size of the tuple just to keep track of whether it's hot or not. The, uh, the second approach is to go offline, and what that means is that the, the database system will record like an in-memory log uh, of all the individual accesses that the queries and transactions make while they're running, but this is just sitting and getting updated in a private buffer to the thread doing the access, so though there's no contention on a global data structure, we're not storing for every single tuple uh, this metadata and paying the penalty as we saw up here. So this is just some, some, some additional tracking we're doing that has low overhead at runtime for, uh, for queries as they access data. But then now, uh, periodically, there'll be a background thread that picks up and looks at all this log information from the different threads and then computes some histograms to, 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 to figure out the access fre frequencies of individual tuples. So, this one is, is cooperative because all the threads are sort of helping along maintaining the metadata. This one is, uh, is a separate background thread to go ahead and, and combine this information together. All right, so the next thing to do is uh, how, basically how to recognize when the database system is, is running out of memory. So a simple approach is just to have a administrator defined threshold that says when my database system's sort of total memory usage gets to be about 80% or 90% of the amount of memory that's allocated to my database system, then I'll fire off my eviction, uh, my eviction policy and go ahead and start shoving things, things out the disk, right? Again, in this case, the data system is responsible for removing this data because there's nothing else that can control this. It's us managing our memory and therefore we have to do this. Uh, we can't rely on the operating system. Typically in database system, I mean, for every database system, whether it's in memory or not, the, the administrator, the, the, the database system has to be told by a human how much memory they're allowed to use. Again, whether it's the buffer pool size for, for a disk ordering system or just the you know, in memory size of the heaps for a in memory database system, it's, at the end of the day, someone has to tell us how much memory we're allowed to use. So we just then set a threshold and say, when I forget to 85% of that threshold, or that total upper bound, then I start evicting. The other approach is to do this on demand, um, and this is where uh, if the database system recognizes that it doesn't have any more memory to bring in a new piece of data from disk that it needs, then it runs its replacement policy, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, but th you know, think of it as LRU, to identify which pages are no longer needed or unlikely to be, be used in the future, and we can go ahead and shove, shove them out the disk then reclaim that space for the new piece of data that, that we want to bring in. So again, you could use LRU or clock to approximate LRU. Lean store uses an approximation of, of clock, which they call second chance, and we'll see what that looks like in a second. All right, so now, assuming that we have a way to, to fire off the eviction or to move data out to disk, we have a way to identify what our cold data is and what we need to move out to disk. Now the question we have to deal with is, when it's been written to disk, what do we still maintain in memory to keep track of this data actually, you know, there used to be tuples here, there used to be data here in memory, but it, it no longer is, and here's where to go find it. So the first approach is to use uh, tombstones, and this is where we will have a marker, or a special kind of tuple that we have in our, in our table that says, this tuple you're looking for at this address does not exist, but here's where to go find it. Here's the block ID and offset in that block to go get the data that you're looking for. And any time that you see, you know, if you follow a pointer doing a scan and come across this tombstone pointer or tombstone tuple, you could then say, all right, well, let me go talk to the cold data storage layer and say, go get this data that I'm looking for. So if you evict a tuple that uh, has shoved up the disk and you replace it with the tombstone, then you have to go update the index now for any or all any index for that table that's pointing to the old evicted tuple to now point to the tombstone tuple. Right? And again, that way there's no false negatives. Your, your data is always there. Your data is always uh, identifiable. 
The next approach is to use bloom filters. Uh, and this is where you evict all the data out the disk. Uh, you evict all you know, the tuples out the disk. But instead of maintaining a tombstone per tuple that's evicted, you just have like, this bloom filter, which is you know, an approximate data structure that has set membership that says whether or not there, there could exist a tuple for a given key out in the cold data storage. And so what happens is I, if I'm looking for a particular uh, key on a table, I check the real in-memory index. If it says it's there, then I, that's gonna have a pointer to, to the real tuple, uh, so I'm done in memory. If it says it's not there, then I go check this bloom filter, and if it says uh, it's not there, then I know it doesn't exist at all, because a, a bloom filter would never give you false, po false negatives, but it could give you false positives. If it does say the key exists and it's out in cold data storage, then I go fetch this on disk index that I bring into memory and then I find the real location on disk for the tuple that I'm looking for. Again, I'll, I'll, explain, I'll explain these two in the next slide. The other two approaches are to do either uh, database system managed memory or OS managed memory or, or virtual memory. And the, for this one, the, the database system is going to keep track of on a, at, a, at a page level whether the page actually exists in memory or not, or the block level. Same kind of thing. So I can't tell you whether an individual tuple exists, but if I know it, that it would exist in this block, and that block has been written to disk, then I know the tuple that I want is on disk. So with OS virtual memory, it's going to work the same way. It's just in this case, the OS is going to track what's in memory or you know, what's in memory versus what's on disk. And this is the data system is going to track it. So we're going to focus on these two because these are going to be uh, the, you know, these are using like the fine grain tube identification approach that we've talked about. We will discuss how to do this one with Lean Store and Umbra. And then we, we will see a technique from uh, EPFL of doing this, this OS managed memory in, in, uh, in, uh, in using VoltDB and, and a few more slides as well. So we'll cover all of these, but I'm going to first discuss and show explicit examples of these two here. All right, so again, this is our same setup that we had before, in-memory index, in-memory table heap, and cold data storage. So again, assuming we have some way to look at how our tuples are being accessed, and we can compute a histogram that says, here's the access frequency of every single individual, individual tuple. We can use this information to identify that these three tuples here have been, are, are the, the least likely to be accessed again, because they've been accessed the least often in my last, my, you know, the last time I did this check. So I'm gonna go ahead and write those out to my cold data storage. So now, again, the, the indexes are still pointing to these old, old lo locations here. Uh, so now what will happen is if I go and use tombstones, then I will, I will have a marker for every single tuple that I removed with, and, re and have a corresponding tombstone tuple that's going to have the block ID and the offset of where they exist on disk. So now then I update my in-memory index to now instead of pointing to the old locations in the table heap, they now point to the, the tombstone tuples. So if a query comes along and looks up, you know, key X, Y, Z, they follow the index and get one of these pointers. I check a flag that says you're looking at a tombstone pointer, uh, tombstone tuple pointer, or sorry, you're looking at a tombstone tuple, not a, not a data tuple. And therefore I know that the, my block ID and offset will tell me where to go f fetch the data that I'm looking for on disk. In this example here, I'm showing the, uh, the, the tombstone tuples being stored in the same data table as the as the, as the regular uh, in-memory tuples. In actuality, though, you want to store these as separate, separate data tables. You have one per, per you know, regular table because the schema is going to be different, right? In the, in the, in the reg regular table, you know, the, 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 the tuples can have any arbitrary number of columns as defined by uh, the schema when you created the table. In the case of the tombstone tuples, these are going to be stored, these are only stored storing two 32-bit values, the block ID and the offset number. So I wouldn't actually want to store these in the same table heap because if I allocate the total amount of space I would normally have for a regular tuple for a tombstone tuple, then I get no benefit from this and I'm just wasting space. So, uh, right, so for that reason, they're stored separately. And the reason why you want to have a separate tombstone table per data table instead of one giant uh, tombstone table for all tables in your database is because when I do a sequential scan, 
meaning I'm not going through an index and I'm just sort of scanning through one by one through contiguous regions of memory for my table. After I'm done scanning the regular table heap, the in-memory tuples, then I need to start doing scans on the, on the tombstone tuples. Now, I can't do any predicate evaluations on, on the tombstones because there's no data in there. All the data is out here on disk. But there are some queries I could potentially do, like count queries, uh, where I could, I could uh, you know, just count the number of tuples that exist in my entire table. I could apply them on, I, I could run that kind of query on this and still have the correct, correct amount without having to go there. Or now if I'm also maintaining uh, the, in the in-memory zone map for what the values actually exist in here, and recording that for a block of tombstone tuples, I could then still do a scan on there and, and be able to compute some answers for some queries. But anytime I need to actually know what the exact value for one individual tuple is, uh, for one given attribute within a tuple, then I gotta go out the disk and, and get it. Another optimization you can do with this, but we actually never implemented this in, in, in HDOR, is that uh, even though this is out on the disk, uh, you can still maybe still, uh, use the indexes as a covering index. Like if I know all the attributes that I need to answer my query can be found in this index, I don't even have to go follow the, the pointers to go get, get the data on disk. The index has everything I need. Another thing we thought about what we never actually did would be Say I have indexes that uh, for a table that have all the attributes for my, my table. Like I have three attributes and there's an index, there's a separate index on each of those three attributes. So now my query comes along, does a lookup on one of those attributes, I would follow along and I'm with this tombstone tuple here. But then rather than going out the disk and getting it, I can maybe do a reverse search in my index and go find the uh, the corresponding key that matches to my value, basically me just scanning along the leaf nodes like this. And that actually might end up being cheaper than having to go fetch, you know, some block from disk and bring it into memory. Because it's more than just the disk I.O. I gotta go bring it into memory and potentially update indexes as well. So one idea would be if I have enough, if I don't have a single index that could cover my query, but the combination of them, the intersection of them would, it might be cheaper to go back and do uh, you know, leaf node scans, or depending what data structure I'm using, to find the, find all the values, find the match, matches for my given tombstone. But we never actually implemented, implemented that. All right, so the next one is the, the bloom filter approach. Um, and so again, the idea here is that we have a bloom filter for every single index we have in memory, and then add on disk for the, every, every single, uh, for every single block or a, common, a set of blocks, we'll have an on-disk index, just another B plus tree, that we can use to identify for the given key that we're looking for, where do we go find it? And the idea here is that we want to reduce the size of this index because in the tombstone case, I still have all the keys for, tu for tuples that have been evicted. But with the balloon filter, any key that's been evicted, or any tuple that's been evicted, we remove those keys from the index. So now the index gets reduced in size. So if a query comes along and says, does key X exist? I always check the in-memory index first. If it says it's there, then it'll have a pointer to the tuple and I'm done. If it says it doesn't exist, then I consult its bloom filter. And then again, same thing. The bloom filter says it doesn't exist, I'm done. If it says it does exist, then I go do a lookup on the in-memory, in, the on-disk index, and that'll tell me now uh, where the location is the block ID and the offset of where the tuple that it is that I'm looking for. And then I sort of have to co copy back in. Okay. So now, you know, depending on whether we're using the tombstones or the, the bloom filter approach or OS managed memory or database system managed memory, we now got to bring, bring our data back in. So then we can then have our query run on it. So the question you have to deal with is what do we do with the tuples that we brought in? Because again, in an old OTP environment, it's very likely that the, for a given block of data, we're only gonna need a subset of the tuples for our query that are in that block. So what do we do with all the, all the other ones? So the first choice is that we're just gonna merge all those tuples we find in the block we fetch from disk back into our, our table heap, right? Regardless of whether they're needed or not. And so what does that mean in the case of the bloom filter, case, in bloom filter arrangement or the, or the, the tombstone tuples? Now we gotta go update the indexes to now point now to the, the tuples we just merged in. 
So if, if I needed one tuple in my block and my block has a million tuples, now I have to do a million updates to my index to now to point to the one million tuples that I just brought in. And the downside of this is that it's very likely the tuples we just brought, brought in are going to be evicted again. So we sort of have this ping pong or thrashing effect where we're merging data back from our index or on our indexes and back into our table heap from, from disk into memory. And then we run our eviction algorithm and then they get shoved out the disk right away because they're cold all over again. The other approach is to only merge back the, uh, the tuples that we need within the block. And so in this case here, we identify just what's the minimum allowance we need. We bring that into our table heap. We update those indexes. But now we have this problem of the, the disk page of the cold data. If we don't record that we have evicted that data, uh, sorry, that we move that data back into memory, and therefore the, 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 the tuple shouldn't be existing on that block anymore, we can write out the new block without that tuple in it, but that would be expensive because now for every single read just to go access a tuple, I got to do one disk IO to read it in. I pull it out, merge it back into the table heap, and then another disk IO to write it out and say uh, the, the tuple doesn't exist anymore. So you have to maintain some additional bookkeeping to keep track of these holes, and you probably want to record them in a log rather than in the, uh, in the, the Victor block itself. And then there's some background process you could run to do compaction or coalescing to combine a bunch of blocks that have a bunch of different holes together into a single block. The reason why you have to keep track of these holes is because what would happen is if I fetch a block, get a, get a tuple back, I merge a tuple back in, and then now that first block shouldn't have that tuple, but it's still physically there, just, but I haven't recorded that it shouldn't be there. If that tuple gets evicted again, now gets written to another block, I could have the same tuple duplicated multiple times in these separate cold data blocks. And if I crash and come back, now I don't know which one is actually the, the right one I should, be, I should be merging in. I have a bunch, bunch of work I have to do on the recovery side to deal with that. The, all right, the, the, uh, the second last issue is, is what is the threshold we're going to use to determine whether to merge something in or merge a tuple back in? So again, with Lean Store, we don't really have this issue because everything is controlled by pages that we can swap in and out of the disk. This is mostly again when you're doing, this is just needed when you're doing the fine-grained tuple-based identification and eviction. So the easiest approach is what I said before, is just always merge it. Whatever tuples I decide I'm, I want to merge, I'm just going to always put them back in the table heap and update the indexes. The next approach is to only merge them when there's an update, as this means is that if my query just wants to read a tuple, I will go uh, fetch the block that it, that it wants, uh, but put it in a temporary buffer, allow the query to read it, and then immediately discard the buffer. Right? So this way, I don't have to update any, in, any indexes. If it is updated, then uh, if, the, if the query is trying to do an update, then I'll go ahead and merge it first, then allow them to do the update. And then the last one is that we can be a bit clever and actually maintain the access frequency of of of, of evicted blocks, um, essentially how often they're being you know are they being retrieved, and if my access frequency goes above some threshold, then I've decided that within my current time window this block is being accessed all the time, so it's probably a good, good idea for me to keep this around. So it's sort of like in the same way we would keep track of how tuples are being accessed or pages are being accessed while it's in memory. We also can maintain information that says how often a page is being accessed you know, from disk. All right, so the last one we want to talk about is what do we do with the query or transaction that accessed cold data? Uh, you know, with how, how should we uh, respond to it? So the easiest thing to do is just to abort the transaction, abort the query, and restart it. Um, and the idea here is that we they go to access a tuple that's not in memory. We record what tuple they wanted uh, or what data they actually wanted. And then we abort it. A separate background thread then kicks off and fetches the data that they need, uh, that, that they wanted, and then merges it based on the, the policy that we just talked about. And when the data is actually available, we have a way of either restarting the transaction, like if it's running as a store procedure on, on the server side, or we, we could potentially notify the client and say, hey, the data you want is actually now available. The, 
that last one, nobody actually, nobody actually supports this, right? So it's basically you abort the transaction and can send back an exception over to ODBC or JDBC and, and give an error code to say, the data you want is not in memory, please retry. Um, you know, those similar ones were deadlocks and things like that. So it's not unfeasible that you couldn't do this, uh, but no system actually does this explicitly for, for uh, evicted data and in-memory database system. So the tricky thing with this is going to be is that if I have a transaction or a query that wants to run with a strong isolation level, like snaps to isolation or serializable isolation, I have to have multi-version concurrency. So I have to use, I have to have multi-versioning in order to allow a uh, transaction to get restarted multiple times or sort of paused and, 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 re and restarted. Uh, and at least have a consistent snapshot of, of the database. So with this one, it's not really you're aborting. You, yes, you're aborting and restarting it, but when you come back the second time, your transaction ID will, will be, still be the same. And the idea here is that uh, this allows you, again, you have a consistent snapshot of the table or whatever you're trying to access, even though you may be running it at different, um, different invocations of the query. So the way to think about this is say I have a, a, a query that wants to scan the entire table, but only half of the table can exist in memory at a given time. What would happen is with this approach is I would, the query would start, it would, it would begin scanning and get through the first half of the table, and then it would try to access the next half, uh, and then it would, it, would, it would hit up either a tombstone tuple or somehow identify that the tuple that it wants is not there. Then there's a, uh, it gets aborted, the background thread fetches the, the, the remaining data that it actually needs um, by evicting the, 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 the first half of the table, and then my transaction or query can get restarted. But if I'm restarting from the beginning, then I'm going to hit the same issue where I, the first thing I need to go fetch is not in memory, and now I have to get aborted, and now the first half gets paged in, the second half gets written out, and I never can actually complete. Or I have to run with an inconsistent snapshot where transactions could be updating the, the second half while my waiting for my transaction to get restarted. Or if I have a consistent snapshot, then I just sort of essentially pause garbage, garbage collection while I go f f flush out the first half, bring in the second half, and I come back and I still have a, a consistent view or consistent snapshot of the table. As I said, nobody actually does this one that I'm that I am aware of uh, you know, for this reason because it, it makes it tricky to guarantee consistency. The more common approach is to do synchronous retrieval. And the idea here is that it's essentially what a disk oriented database does now. When I try to access something that's not in memory, my transaction gets paused or stalled while another thread or my, the, the, the disk uh, controller or why the, the, the disk manager fetches the data that I, that I need and brings it into memory. And once, in, once it's in memory, then I'm allowed to proceed and start running. So there's some games you can play with some of these. Uh, like, I could try to let a query keep running for as long as it can, uh, accessing uh, evicted data, and I just sort of have to do like a Jedi mind trick. Like it says, oh, I, I want to read this tuple, and you pretend that it could actually read it. Some queries can do this, some other queries can't. Uh, and it's only when they actually try to return results to the application or do something with the individual attributes on the evicted data, then you go ahead and pause it or, or abort it. Um, and the idea here is that you can kind of let the query run as long as possible, identify all the, the tuples or all the pages it's going to access, and then at some point you say, all right, well, I've seen enough. Let me go fetch the big batch of things that you need. Uh, and so that way you're not like this run, stall, run, stall over and over again. You can maybe do a bunch of sequential I.O., fetch it all in, and then uh, and let it run uh, more quickly. All right, so now I want to go through a bunch of different implementations of systems that support larger than, than memory databases. And the way this is going to be organized is that the first four here are all going to be using the, the sort of fine-grained tuple-based approach that we talked about before, or talked about so far. And then the, uh, these three meaning systems are actually going to be page-based. Again, at the high level, they're all going to achieve the same goal, that we can have a, a memory database system that can maintain and, and store 
databases that are larger than the amount of memory that's available to the system without having to do uh, any rewriting of the application to, to some extent. Um, and the spoiler of what I'll say is that the, the page-based approaches, in particular from Lean Store and Umbra, I, I think are the right way to go. And these tuple-based ones are a little bit too fine-grained and the sort of the storage and uh, uh, computational overhead you pay or the penalty you pay from being able to support this, I think is, uh, is, is not worth it. So again, we'll go through each of these one by one, but I think the Lean Store Umber one is, is, is probably the right way to go. So as I said before, uh, the, the paper of all the different implementation issues or, or design decisions was based on a system that I helped build when I was in grad school called HStore that was then commercialized as VoltDB. And an early prototype of, um, of HStore that supported writing data out the disk was this component we called anti-caching. And again, the idea is like it's a reverse of a cache. Instead of fetching hot data from disk and pulling into memory, uh, we push cold data out from, from memory onto disk. So given all the different design decisions we talked about, HStore here is going to be doing online identification. It's going to maintain an LRU chain in the header of every single tuple. We do sampling to make sure that we're not updating it every single time our transaction runs to avoid too much overhead. Um, but it's still in 64 bits for every single uh, tuple. It's going to have an administrator defined threshold to identify that the data that you need uh, or when you're running out of space and go ahead and kick off the eviction policy. We're going to use tombstone tuples. We're going to do the abort and restart approach, which we can do because all transactions in um, in HStore going to run or have to run as store procedures. It's going to do block level granularity of, of merging in, in data. And then in the original implementation, it would always merge them. Right? It, the original implementation couldn't decide, oh, this is the data, this data is being updated, so let me go ahead and, and merge just that, just that piece or have it, the, the side buffer. It just always grabbed whatever the block was, updated all the indexes that merged it in. So needless to say that this had uh, you know, quite a bit of overhead to, to, to support this. The other sort of major implementation around this time uh, that, that supported larger than memory databases came out of, uh, was part of the, the Hecaton project. Um, again, Hecaton was the in-memory storage or execution engine that Microsoft built for SQL Server. I think now they're just called in-memory tables, but the, if you search Hecaton, then it shows up. So this was a side project or a research project called Project Siberia that was, again, looking at how to extend Hecaton to support uh, databases that exceed the amount of memory that's available. So the main thing about this one was this is where, where the balloon filter stuff that we talked about came from. And the idea is that you do the offline identification, the same threshold as HDOR with it, that's defined by the administrator. We'll, we'll remove uh, values or keys from evicted tuples from the, from the in-memory indexes, but then update or maintain a bloom filter to keep track of whether the key actually could exist out on disk. And then when transactions try to access that cold data, we would actually pause them or stall them uh, and then go fetch it and, and, and bring it in. And they were always doing uh, this merging at a tuple level granularity. And they, again, like in HDOR, they would always merge everything. So to best my knowledge, all this Siberia stuff from Microsoft never actually made it to production, never actually made it into the real Hackathon system. And I think a part of this was just sort of the, the engineering complexity of, of sort of maintaining the cold data plus the hot data and the um, sort of inconsistent performance you could get from you know, sometimes your tuples are in memory, sometimes, sometimes they're not, and you don't really know that until you actually run them. So for these reasons, I, Hecaton never actually got this, this functionality. And likewise, I don't think Volt TV ever got the, the anti-caching stuff that we were doing in h either. All right, another interesting system is, uh, came from EPFL, and this was developed by Natasa Alamaki and her group in, in Switzerland. Natasa used to be the the, the database professor at CMU before I showed up, and she, she actually taught the earlier versions of 721 uh, 13 years ago. Um, so what are they going to do? So they're going to do offline identification, the same with that, um, that, that Siberia did. But now they're going to have the OS manage uh, memory and make decisions on how to evict things out to disk. But they're going to be clever about this. They're only going to let the OS evict 
certain certain portions of, of the of the ta table heap, and uh, they'll have a hot portion that they maintain, but that never gets written out to disk. And then they're going to move data to the cold cold portion of of the heap and let the OS page things out as needed. So because it's doing uh, it's, it's using MMAP and the, it's doing virtual memory, the OS is swapping things out. It's going to do synchronous retrieval because the the data system doesn't know actually what's in memory versus not in memory. It's going to do page level granularity because that's how MMAP works, and they're always going to merge things um, because again, that's, that's well, the rest of the system doesn't know that a tuple has been evicted. It still has a pointer to the the cold portion of the heap, and then when it goes tries to access it, then it gets then it gets uh, there's a page fault and it's swapped in, right? So this is the key part here that's different. Uh, than, than what we've seen before. So let's see how this works. So here's our in-memory table heap, here's our cold storage. Again, this is being man this is just swap space that's being managed by the operating system. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna divide the memory heap into hot tuples and cold tuples. And for the hot portion of, of the heap, they're gonna use mlock to pin these pages in memory. And this is, the mlock prevents the OS from, from writing this data out to disk. But the cold tuple portion, that's not locked. Are not pinned, so now that the operating system can, can at any any time decide to evict this data out. So let's say now uh, we have this all flight identification that that the, the data system is going to have to run identifies that this data this tuple here is cold. So what we're going to do is copy it now into uh, the cold tuple. It's essentially a delete followed by an insert, like an internal transaction does a delete followed by an insert, and this will automatically update the indexes now to point to. Uh, the new location for this, the physical location of this tuple. And then uh, we, can, we can put whatever new data we want here. At some later point, if the OS decides that it's running out of memory, it can decide to go ahead and swap any of the pages that are in the, the cold tuple region. But we have no way of determining uh, is this data in, in memory or not, other than asking the operating system, right? which, which would be a syscall, which are usually a bad idea. So the tricky thing we have to make sure, of course, then is we want to make sure that all our tuples are page aligned because we don't want to have the issue where uh, the tuple may may be split across multiple multiple pages, and now things are going to be tricky to make sure that we write out uh, these pages in the correct order to make sure that we don't see one without the other. Right? We want to sort of do this atomically, which is not something operating system can can provide for us because MMAP, MMAP cannot be atomic across multiple pages, which now means that we have to maintain a log somewhere to keep track of what's happening over here. So so I think this is an interesting idea because it's it's using MMAP in a clever way for data that is read mostly. Um, but to, to handle the case for this or when there's updates, you need a log to keep track of what's happening here. All right, the last tuple-based approach I want to talk about comes from uh, Apache Geode. So Apache Geode was originally this data system, in memory data system called, called Gemfire. Long story short, uh, Gemfire was developed by this other company called Gemstone, and then Pivotal bought them, um, excuse me, and then VMware bought them. Uh, but then VMware decided they didn't want to own database companies, so then they divested it and combined it with EMC's Greenplum, and that became Pivotal. And then I guess Pivotal decided they didn't want to, you know, sort of actively maintain uh, Gemfire or whatever. So then they, they dumped it off to uh, the Apache Foundation. So it's Apache Geo. So what are they doing? It's online identification, like an HDOR. It's administrator defined threshold, just like before. Uh, as far as I know, they're using tombstones to identify that tuples have been removed from memory, and now they actually reside on HDFS. And this is all assuming that you run on HDFS. Uh, they'll do synchronous retrieval because they'll block th queries and bring things in. They'll do it at a tuple-based granularity. But the interesting thing is that they're only going to merge tuples and bring them back into memory and discard the uh, disk-based blocks uh, whenever you do updates. And the reason why they do this is because HDFS is a pen only. So it, it would be, it's a, be kind of a pain for them to do in place updates to a block that already exists, uh, you'd have to either write a log message and say, this old block has been evicted, uh, sorry, it has been pulled back into memory and is no longer considered uh, sort of valid or up to date. Uh, you, so in their world, to avoid that big penalty, 
uh, and then also running things out to disk later on, they just update a log message to say, yes, this thing's been removed, but they only want to do it on, on an update. So as far as I know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure people are using this, but I, I have not come across anybody in the wild that has been using uh, these, these overflow tables in Apache Geode. Okay, so now, as I sort of alluded to so far, everything we've talked about, at least in the, the HDOR, Hecaton, uh, VoltDB, and, and, and Apache Geode examples, these are all doing evictions based on, on a per tuple basis, right? It means we have to keep track of individual tuples, how they're being read, how they're being updated, and then we make decisions about how to, um, how to evict them. You know, we're making those decisions on, on a per tuple basis to combine them into a page or block and write them out to disk. But with the exception of, uh, of Project Siberia, all of these would, wouldn't actually reduce the size of indexes. And furthermore, none of them can actually spill the index or write portions of the index out, out the disk. So only Project Siberia would pull the index, keys out of the index and reduce the size of the index and then populate with the bloom filter, which is going to be much smaller than the, than the, than the keys would have been if they existed in the index. But other than that, they can't identify, oh, well, this portion of the index or my indexes, they're, they're not being updated or accessed very often. So let me go ahead and shove those things out the disk. And as we saw when we talked about compression, I showed at the end when we talked about how to do index compression, for some OTB databases, the size of the indexes can be quite uh, significant relative to the overall size of the database, right? And in some examples, we saw the indexes were up to 60% of the total memory size of, of a database. So all the things we're doing here are not actually targeting for those applications or for those databases what the, the bulk of the memory is actually being used for. So what we really want is a unified approach, a unified model for evicting cold data at the disk from either table or from either indexes, right? We shouldn't have to have separate policies or separate, uh, uh, separate mechanisms for both of these. It should just be a, a single approach used across both types of data. So this is how we ended up with the, the, the paper I had you guys read on, on Lean Store. Um, and so Lean Store is a, was a prototype in-memory storage manager that was developed by the Germans at Munich that worked on the Hyper system. But to the best of my knowledge, this wasn't actually part of the Hyper project. This was a, this was a standalone separate thing. And so what's really cool about what Lean Store can do is, again, it's designed from the ground up to uh, evict pages and it doesn't know and doesn't care whether those pages belong to uh, two parts for you know, data tables or they belong to uh, indexes. So the way to think about what they're doing is that Lean Store is, provides a decentralized buffer pool manager that is based on a page hierarchy, meaning instead of having uh, instead of having just sort of like in a regular page table, just an unordered list of, of, of pages, it's going to be organized as a tree structure. And the idea is going to be that you can't evict a, the main idea is that you can't evict a child page, uh, sorry, you can't evict a parent page unless it's all its child pages have been evicted to disk either. And then also now because they are uh, of, uh, page based, the overhead of tracking how pages are accessed is going to be much less than having to do it on a, on a per tuple basis in, in, in the other systems we talked about here. So, but now the way they're actually going to do tracking is interesting because they're actually not going to track at all most of the time. And so the way they're going to decide what to evict is that they're just going to randomly select some pages. Uh, and then if a page is selected, then they start tracking whether how it's being accessed or whether it's being accessed. And then at some point when we need to free up space, we go look at that tracking information from the, random, the last you know, round of randomly selected pages and we find the ones that haven't been touched or haven't been accessed and we go ahead and, and, and evict those, right? So you only turn on uh, the, the, the tracking identification, the page identification when you randomly select a page to be evicted. So we'll go through all these, the, these policies in, in more detail. But the key thing they're gonna do uh, instead of using a tombstone, instead of using the bloom filter, the key thing they're gonna to do to figure out whether a block or page exists in memory is through a technique called pointer swizzling. So I don't think we've covered uh, po 
corner swizzling that much in the intro class, but so I'm gonna cover that now in the advanced class. So the idea of pointer swizzling is that we are going to switch the, or sort of flip the contents of a pointer that one object has to another object based on whether we know that, whether that, that object that it being, is being pointed to is in memory or not. So the, again, the idea is that, uh, and so, so to, keep, to figure this out, we only need to use one bit in the pointer. So we'll use the first bit to, to, to say one that it's, that it's on disk, zero if it's in memory, and then the rest of the 63 bits in our 64 bit pointers will actually be used for the address. That's actually not entirely true either because on x86, uh, uh, the current architecture only uses 48 bits of a 64 bit address to, to define the memory location of, of a, something in memory, right? So they can only actually store up to 35 terabytes of memory Intel claims they're eventually going to use the whole 64 bits. I was at a talk that Intel gave three or four years ago where they said, hey, don't store anything extra in the remaining 16 bits of your pointers because eventually Intel is going to use it. But like I said, that, that hasn't happened yet. And as far as I know, it's still just 48 bits. So you can use the upper 16 bits to do whatever you want. So let's say we have here, we have uh, two blocks and b block B1 has a pointer to block B2. So when the pointer is unswizzled, meaning that it's pointing to something on disk, then the, the bit will be set, to, the first bit will be set to one saying that it's unswizzled. Um, and then, the, then we'll just have our page ID and offset, like 32-bit page ID, 32-bit uh, offset. But now if we go, uh, and this will be 64 bits in total. And now if we go actually uh, uh, swizzle that address, because we, we brought in the block into memory, We'll flip that first bit to zero, saying that what you're looking at is a real uh, in-memory address, not a page ID and offset. And then the remaining bits would be used to actually point to the memory location. So what happened is when you when you pass a memory address, you know, in, in your program to say go access the thing for me to do a load, you know, this thing's not used because it's it's not part of the 48 bits that the x86 cares about. So it's just just ignored. So we don't have to do anything special when we do a memory address lookup using these swizzled addresses. The, the Harvard just takes care of it for us, right? So the reason why you want to do this is because this is going to allow us to have a decentralized way to track whether a page is in memory or not. Right? This is what a, a page table or a, would do in a disk-based system, right? You, you, it'd be this, this giant map that says page ID 123 is, is in disk or on disk or in memory. And if it's in memory, here's the address to it. The or, you know, or the mapping table in the B plus or the BW tree was essentially the same thing. So rather than having a centralized data structure, if we ensure that in our in our database system that only one block will have a pointer to another block, then we know that there's only one location where there's this pointer to this other block. So we just can do a compare and swap on this to be able to flip it to be swizzled or unswizzled, because we don't have to worry about trying to do atomic updates across multiple pointers. And so if we think now in like a, you know, like a, a B plus tree, if you ignore sibling pointers, you're, you're essentially going to get this for free because that's, you know, it's, a, it's an acyclic graph. All right, so another interesting thing, interesting thing about LeanStar was, again, the eviction policy. It wasn't maintaining LRU, it wasn't doing a clock, it was just randomly picking some, some blocks for eviction uh, and then figuring out whether they are going to actually be accessed. So. What's great about this is that you don't have to maintain any metadata as we did in, in the other approaches for hot data, because if it's hot, then you don't track any information. But if it's, if it's potentially cold, then you go ahead and track this information. So what will happen is that I evict some, some blocks, I select some blocks to be evicted, and then I'm going to uh, maintain this global hash table that's going to keep track of of, of the tracking info of how this, this block are, is being accessed. And then if I, if I determine that when it's time to go free some memory, I go check that, that, that hash table and I see here's some, some blocks that haven't been accessed, then I know it's, having, it's safe for me to go ahead and evict them. So again, what will happen is I randomly pick some blocks. I'm going to unswizzle their pointers, meaning it will revert back to the page ID and offset. But the, uh, I'm not actually going to evict the, the block still going to sit in memory. 
And then what will happen is if now a thread comes along, a query runs, and it, it comes across a unswizzled pointer with the page ID and offset, I go check that global hash table for the data in my cooling stage. And if it's in there, then I know it's actually still in memory and I can go find out where it is. If it's not in there, then I know it actually is not in memory at all and I go out the disk and get it. And we'll, we'll show an example of what this looks like in a second. So the, the, uh, the last thing that's important about Lean Store is that, this, again, the block hierarchy, again, the, there's no centralized uh, buffer pool table, so we need a way to, to in, in, ensure that there isn't more than one pointer to a, to a block in the database so that I can just unswizzle one location. I know that I, or swizzle or unswizzle one location, I know that that's been covered everywhere. So they're gonna organize this as a tree hierarchy. And so every parent can have a pointer to a child and that, that parent is the only one with that pointer to, to that given block. Now, so in indexes, they're already sort of managed like this. So if you ignore sibling pointers again, um, for table heaps, you have to organize it uh, as a hierarchy and then do breadth for search to do scans. Um, in, I think in the lean store case, there was always index organized tables. And in the case of Umbrella, they're, they're gonna do the same thing. So why do you wanna do this? Well, again, because I know that uh, if I want to evict a parent, I can't evict it to disk unless its children have been evicted. And this prevents me from having this situation where I evict a parent, but its children aren't still in memory. The parent gets written out the disk. And then now when it gets fetched back in, it's going to have, you know, when it was written out, it would have um, in memory pointers to the children where they exist before in memory. But now when I come back, those memory addresses now be, might be pointing to frames in my buffer pool that now have different pages than that what were in there before. And so now I'm, I'm pointing to garbage. I'm not pointing to things I should be looking, or should be pointing at. So by ensuring that the children are evicted out first, the children get evicted, I update the parent now to have, uh, to unswizzle pointers to his children so that when it gets written out to disk and I bring it back in, I can then uh, use those unswizzle pointers to find the pages that have the tuples I'm looking for. So just in the same way, I can't fetch, I can't evict a, pa a parent before its children have been evicted. I can't fetch children until its parent has been uh, fetched, which you, which you guarantee because everything's in this tree hierarchy. All right, so let's uh, look at an example. So the way we're gonna organize this, again, say we have a really simple database that only has four pages. And so we're gonna break the, uh, the hierarchy up into three stages. So we have the hot stage where everything's in memory uh, and you have uh, swizzle pointers. Then you have the cooling stage where it still exists in memory, but you're gonna have unswizzle pointers. And then you have the cold stage where it's out on disk with unswizzle pointers. So let's say that I run my eviction algorithm that randomly picks some blocks to be written out the disk. And let's say I, I pick B1. So I'm gonna move it down now into the cooling stage, and then I'm going to add it into my hash table over here that, that's tracking, again, the access patterns or the, the, how often the, this block actually is being accessed. So this hash table is basically saying for B1, here's where to go find it in this, in this eviction queue, and then the eviction queue would have the, uh, the actual memory pointer to, to this block. So now, what would happen is that if, uh, if uh, and then of course, then I have to make sure I update the, or unswizzle the pointer from my, my parent block. Again, now if anybody comes along and tries to access B1, they would have to go through B0, that's in memory, then they would get this unswizzle pointer, but then I would always do a lookup in my hash table, and I would find an entry for B1, find the location in the eviction queue, and that would give me the real memory address. So now you're paying a bit of penalty now, just as you would having that indirection layer in a page table in a disk or in a database system, but it's actually not that bad because, again, if this was hot data, then the first time this would happen, I would then bump it back up to the hot stage, remove it from my eviction queue, and then, un, uh, then swizzle the pointer. And so only one query would ever pay this penalty. But if it actually really was cold, then nobody would actually come across this uh, and have to go through this hash table and eventually we'd get it right out to disk and, you know, no harm, no foul. So this is actually really interesting, right? And the idea is also too that this eviction queue is keeping track of, uh, this is essentially is naturally ordering the, you know, which was, the, what were the latest, the oldest or newest 
page, uh, blocks added to the queue. So now if I need to go fetch something uh, that's on in the cold stage on disk and bring it into memory, I just go evict whatever is in the front of the queue here, uh, shove it at the disk, and then use that space for the tuple, the block that, I'm, that I need. So the, there's only one, one latch you need in this architecture, and that's when you actually write things from the cooling stage to the cold stage, because they just need to protect to make sure that if you try to evict a page or evict a block, at the same time you're trying to fetch that block back in, uh, you don't want to have duplicates and get, get fouled up. So there's only one latch you have to use to protect uh, for, for that concurrent operation, but it, that, that's pretty rare. So like I said, this was a prototype system that was developed by the Germans. Um, I think they're continuing to work on it. Um, it's separate from Hyper, and uh, uh, it's separate from the, uh, from the Umbra project, which we'll talk about next. Right, so Umbra is a, uh, a, a very new system that the Germans have been building. Think of this as like Hyper 2.0. And they are actually supporting the larger than memory uh, database uh, method, the technique that, that, that Lean Store uh, proposed of having this hierarchy with the, the, randomized, um, the, the randomized eviction algorithm. But one of the interesting things that they're going to do differently is that they're going to support variable size pages. So in the case of, uh, of Lean Store, and actually of all the, the, the architectures we've we, we shown before, the pages that were being organized in memory and the pages that were getting written out to disk were always the same size. Um, in Umbra, what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to allow you to, to allocate memory in the same way you would in a slab allocator, like in, in, in like JE Malloc, where you can allocate blocks that are going to be of different sizes. They're always uh, ex exponential from the previous size, and then now you can then address the the entire block of a given size, rather than you know individual tuples or individual offsets within within a block. And so the, the advantage you're going to get for this is that for databases that have large text fields or strings or varchars or other internal data structures like compression dictionaries, where you often can't store them in a single page, you can now uh, avoid the overhead of having to copy those pages in memory and reassemble them whenever you go fetch things uh, from disk. So they, the Umber people, the Germans make actually a really interesting uh, design argument for this system, and they say that it's better, to, when you want to support larger than memory databases, it's better just to have a complex buffer pool manager, like in the case of supporting a variable length one, it's better to make that be efficient, have that be uh, sort of a more complex or difficult to engineer component of the system, because you only have to implement that part once. And now the rest of the system is going to end up being easier to develop because now you have this, this flexibility and this capability of the, the variable size buffer manager. Um, and it's sort of what we said in the beginning about how if you, you don't want to bring back the, you know, the buffer manager and then have to re-architect the, the entire system to, to account for the fact that you could be accessing data that's not on disk. In the same way here, you can not have to worry about uh, you know, packing data in always exactly into a page that, or, you know, a fixed page size, you can allocate the right amount of memory that's needed for whatever it is that you're doing, and the the algorithms of the data structures that you're building on top of that, that the buffer manager, um, don't have to worry about the complexity of how, how, how that's all managed. So I think that's just actually really interesting, and to the best of my knowledge, this is the only data system that's actually doing this, which is pretty exciting. So. Just like in Lean Store, they're going to store things uh, as, as this hierarchy, but all the tables are going to be, all the relations are stored as index organized tables. So basically, all the, it's sort of like in MySQL is in a DB, where all the tuples are stored in the leaf pages of a B plus tree. So you get that natural hierarchy that we needed in, um, in Lean Store, where every child only has, there's only one parent that has a pointer to any one child. So, this is just a high-level overview of what's going on in the variable size buffer pool. And again, the way it's going to work is that it's like a slab allocator where they'll have a bunch of frames uh, in the buffer pool for different size classes. And you'll have more frames for the smaller size classes and, and fewer frames for the larger ones. Because most of, the, most of the, the chunks of memory you're going to allocate are going to be quite small. 
So the, the large size, the small size would be 64 kilobytes and the, that'll go up to 512 kilobytes. So the, in the buffer frames, you would have just sort of inactive and active pools. Everything is gonna actually be managed using MMAP, using anonymized MMAP, and that gives you virtual memory. And so that means that I can allocate, reserve all this space here, but it's actually not backed by physical memory until I go ahead and access it, right? So I can allocate all the space I would need in my buffer pool frame for any, for the total size of the database. Um, but I only, you know, the OS actually is only gonna back it when it's actually needed. So they're also gonna do pointer swizzling the same way you would in, in lean store and, or in other systems. But what's interesting about it is in the lean store case, it was just, if it's swizzled, it's a memory address. If it's unswizzled, here's the page ID and the offset. In this case here, you don't have offsets anymore in pages because you're having a fine grain pointer to the page that has exactly the memory that you need, of, you know, because it's, it's the right size. So if I only need 64 kilobytes, then I have a pointer to those 64 kilobytes and it's left to whoever's getting that 64 kilobytes to be able to, to, to interpret its contents to get the data that, that it's looking for. But I don't need to record that offset in the unswizzle pointer. But I do need to record what size class it's in so that when I go fetch that block, I know which category of, of the data I need to go get it from and how big it actually is gonna be stored out on disk. Because again, the OS with virtual memory, it doesn't know that uh, it's not gonna allow you to do with these memory allocations or page allocations from different sizes, right? It's, it's always gonna be whatever, you know, four kilobytes uh, as the default, or if you're using huge pages, whatever, the two gigabyte ones, it just knows that you have some chunk of memory. So it's up for the, the database system to be able to interpret, you know, how much data do I actually need to read for uh, a, a given page size, right? And that's based on, on the size class down here, right? So. I think this is actually, like I said, I think this is really interesting. This, you know, this was the, this paper came out only a few months ago. No other system, as far as I know, actually implements this. Um, so it's, it remains to be seen whether the, you know, compared to something like Lean Store, uh, that this is the, the right approach to go. But I, I definitely think it's very promising. And I think it's better than the, the stuff that we were doing, you know, years ago with, with HStore or with the, the, the Project Siberia stuff. And so actually, last thing to point out too is like, again, these are still 64-bit pointers. The block ID is now 57 bits. And then this, this size class is, is uh, just uh, six bits. All right, so the last approach I want to talk about is MemSQL, as I'm wearing the, the old school MemSQL shirt. So traditionally, what MemSQL would do is uh, when they brought on the column store, uh, even now today, you can declare that you want a, a table to be stored as a row store and that resides in memory, or you can have a table exist, or you declare a table as a column store and that can actually be backed by disk. But there was no way to, to sort of to declare a single logical table that could have uh, both types. But then in, uh, when they first came out with the column store approach, up to, up to 2017, they were using MMAP to manage the pages out to disk, but they were sort of blindly just using MMAP and you know as, as and not the anonymized memory memory virtual memory allocation that Umbra was doing. So they quickly found out this was actually a bad idea, and there's a blog article that shows that they were sort of abusing MMAP and getting bad performance. So then they built their own buffer pool manager uh, where they would uh, take the columns and split them up into a, one, one uh, segment that had 1 million tuples and knew how to fetch in those segments as, as needed. But they still had a separate, uh, uh, sort of separate row store uh, for, for transactions or OTP workloads and a separate column store for, the, for analytics. So what they then now uh, announced in 2019 is this, what they call a new single store architecture where you, it's like the hyper stuff or the stuff we're doing in our own database system where you can do transactions on top of the, on top of a column store. Um, there's a, this blog article makes a bunch of claims about, you know, make it sort of seem like that they're the first to do this, which is not really true. Um, and then they have some optimizations to deal with the large overhead of storing nulls that we saw before in, in the row stores when we talked about uh, data types. Um, but you know, the, this, they're sort of 
getting away from having separate different uh, in-memory row store and sort of separate column store, and now having a single uh, single column store approach that can you know have pages written out to disk. It's unclear how they're deciding what pages get written out to disk. I suspect it's a basic LRU or clock approach. So now going back to our same taxonomy to talk about before, they don't need any eviction metadata. Uh, for this, it's just keeping track of what pages are in and not in me memory and not in memory. They're doing synchronous retrieval, and then they always just merge things. Okay? All right, so that was a lot. Uh, the, as I said, the, 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 what we talked about today was just dealing with uh, uh, bringing back in the, the disk that's going to be block oriented, that's going to be slow, and trying to be clever about it to avoid slowing down our in memory architecture. And as I said multiple times, I think the block-based or page-based approach used in Lean Store or Umbra is the right way to go. And the fine-grained tuple stuff that we did in, in those other systems is, 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 is not the right approach. Now, the other interesting thing about this is that everything I talked about here today could eventually just all be made null and void and, and obsolete when we actually finally achieve uh, uh, cheap and fast uh, byte address while non-volatile memory. So that means that memory that goes in the DIMM slot and, and then you can read and write to it as if it's DRAM, but when you pull the power, it persists things like, uh, like, like, like an SSD. So that hardware actually exists. We'll cover that next week with like talking about databases running new hardware. For now, SSDs or spinning disk hard drives are all we have for non-volatile storage. But in the future, uh, real persistent memory or real non-volatile memory uh, will make everything we talked about today, I think, unnecessary. All right. So next class, we're going to talk about uh, sort of this is an additional topic that doesn't fit exactly in with everything we talked about, but it's just it's, it's it's another way to get big performance improvements in in a database system if you know what you're doing. So we'll talk about how to way to improve performance of UDFs. Uh, and we'll see two approaches from another set of Germans and from Microsoft. Okay? All right, guys. Uh, wash your hands and take care of yourselves. See ya. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on because I needed just a little more kick. Like a fish after just one sip, yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off. Eight ball just dropped off. This ain't eyes hopped off. And my hood won't be the same. After Ice Cube, take a say eye to the brain. Yeah.